So lecture six, I suppose we should get started. Lab four, we're going to stay on the barn. You're going to have your disadvantage list available for discussion. And we'll go through and kind of create something that helps put that in order. So bring your laptops. We'll also talk about summarizing your time assignment. Um, and that doesn't belong there. And your time assignment is due March 7th. So any questions or concerns? So talking about feeding spaces, this is a time stall. I think I gave this, I handed this out last time. So um, if you want to follow along with those. Um, we've got feed space here. We've got a few inches higher, in this case, four inches. And what the cow is standing on, we got a divider that's eight inches high. We have to, uh, in a freestall situation, that divider between the feed and the standing space is higher but we don't have to accommodate the lunge across it or this possibly the stride eight inches is probably too high for that stride going across because we want that animal to get as far forward as she can so she's got full reach of that bed we have her moving forward and we move the neck rail forward to accommodate that rail the hot or accommodate the crest of the neck so that neck rail is high if we've got it closer to the vertical. If we move forward, move that neck rail forward, we have to lower it down. The downside of that is it makes it harder to clean as that goes lower and lower. Um, also, those drinking cups there can make that a challenge as well. Um, as somebody who's cleaned out mangers, by hand for many, many years. The designs that where you can go through in a tie stall and move everything out with a skid loader, it's like, oh, that would be very nice, as opposed to bucketing everything up, handling everything two or three times. Um, so having that there, that neck rail, that position will influence how you might clean the thing out. So looking at a system in a freestall we've got four of the animals standing on we've got a feed table that's four to six inches higher we've got that divider is a little bit taller than in the tie stall all it has to do is make sure the cows can't step through so we just got to clear the neck coming up underneath that and then we place again that neck rail a little bit forward so she can get all the way up to that divider without damaging herself. So as this goes farther forward, we bring it down lower. The challenge becomes how do we clean that out? What can we do? So it's just stuff you got to think about as you put things together. If we've got the self-locking headlocks, or headlocks, we try to tilt them forward to allow that point of shoulder. The problem is if it's sitting on this divider here, that tilt might only give us an inch or two. I know some places have gone to just putting that head block in front of whatever uprights there are, and you're going to gain two or three more at the point of shoulder. So allowing that animal to get as far forward as she can, so she's got maximum reach with her mouth, to cover as much ground to eat as much as she can. So that tilt there helps that. The challenge again becomes, does that interfere with any of the operations that you might be doing at the major, cleaning it out, filling it up? How much tilt do we put there? So when we're thinking about 
feeding spaces are designed. We either have to be full fed and feed is always within reach. So we're not limiting any time a cow comes to look for food, there's food available. If they're not full fed, then we have to have enough for all animals to eat at the same time. If we're limiting in some way, there's an opportunity for certain animals to get more than others, and that's particularly a problem with heifers, that some animals will eat more and the timid or smaller animals will eat less, and that becomes a problem. So either everybody can eat at the same time, or we design our rations, design our feeding system that there's always feed there. And that becomes a challenge with our heifers. Um, they can eat what they need for a day, probably in three hours, that keeping them full fed throughout the day becomes a challenge. So we have to either those two things and then we want our animals to eat in as natural a position as we can make it without hurting them, without damaging. So as we design our feeding spaces, think about those things. So um, Dr. Grant, he's an expert in feeding behavior, behavior in general. He wrote a booklet about dealing with feeding, feeding behavior. So noting that when we have feed, we got a feed line for our animals, the more traffic we can allow behind that animal, the less likely they are to be bumped, the less likely we are to limit access. If we only have the ability for one animal to pass instead of two, a couple animals here might, and a one stand in here might block access to the center. So it's suggested that we have enough room behind our animals that we can have two animals in theory pass at the same time. That usually doesn't happen. They don't usually have that intense traffic, but there's enough space there for them to move. If we start to limit, we reduce the cost of our building, but we might limit access to our feed. We might increase displacements, not allow those smaller animals to get where they need to be. So we'd like our animals to eat with their natural head down posture. The salivation seems to work better in that play. play. Um, that's some research done in the 1960s. It's a little difficult to do, but getting that cow where she should be. There was a time, certainly when I was growing up, when we did elevated feed bumps. The idea behind those is we're getting stuff up and out of the mud up and out of the dirt, especially for cleaning around them. But there seems to be a lot of unnatural behavior associated, especially a lot of feed tossing with that. Animals taking feed and tossing it. Now, this also might be a anti-fly behavior. If we take feed, we toss it on the back, there's less area for those flies to get access to but it's generally a waste of feed and doesn't help the animal a behavior that we don't need to see so cows we, the way we've bred them they have a tremendous drive to eat and an animal this big eating as much as it does is kind of unusual but we've bred them that way way that we want them to they're trying to feed a calf that they think needs 150 pounds a day if we take a look at a neck rail we're looking down a metal pipe there as feed gets out of reach all those animals leaning and pushing are going to put a bend in that feed line 
So we usually need well casing or something that's going to hang it, hold up over time. So if our push up is not there, they're trying to get feed, they're going to lean into that. So the question is, how hard are they going to lean into that? Enough to start to do damage to their bodies. So these are the bumps that I was talking about. We really didn't see those out in the barn. So you got this big kind of bump or misshapen ball there. The animals are pushing against it. They're damaging their soft tissue. They're causing harm to themselves. The discomfort of being hungry is greater than the uh, pain that they're feeling on their neck. So poorly positioned neck rail and or feet out of reach is going to cause that. Let's see, we got two animals there. So research studies. How much pressure will the animals push? So pressure is below 500 newtons, a measure of pressure, and no effect on the cow. 500 to 1,000 newtons may cause harm. Pressures over 1,000 newtons of, on the skin will cause acute damage. Researchers have evaluated the effect of pressure exerted by cows on self-locking feeders, on feed activity and comfort. Peak pressure occurred when remaining feed in the manger was outside the cow's reach. Almost no pressures greater than 500 recorded during the first Minute a meal, but as the cows ate, the feed within its reach. Pressure against the feed barrier gradually increased as the cows tried to consume feed at the outer limits of their reach. Shortly gave up after trying to reach feed for 14 minutes and left the feed manger. So looking at this, pressure on the feed barrier was greater than 500 newtons for about 70 six seconds, which is harmful in the long term. A pressure of greater than a thousand newtons lasted for 43 seconds, which is going to cause tissue trauma. So they're willing to lean into to reach that feed for three quarters of a minute, two thirds of a minute, where it causes intense damage to their skin. And that's where those homes come from, those are where the bumps on their shoulders come from. They want to eat so bad that they're willing to hurt themselves to do it. So the research indicated a willingness to place pressures up to 2,000 newtons against a feed barrier to reach as much feed as possible. At this amount of pressure, injury can easily occur, especially over multiple days in a row. So the idea is we need to keep that feed in reach. Anytime an animal goes looking for feed, there should be some within reach. So the benefits to tilting, we get an arc that the cow can reach with those headlocks. If there's no tilt forward in this particular configuration, just short of a meter, about three feet. If we put that tilt in, we get what 14 centimeters, which is somewhere around five or six inches more reach. So just that little tilt, it probably would be better if we move that whole thing forward and gave that animal a few more inches so we can get as much as we can and our push-ups aren't as critical. Any questions or thoughts about eating? Eating spaces. So moving on to water, how does a cow drink? How would a cow naturally drink?
Anybody sat and watched the cow drink? If we watch those cows wade into the river, you also see it on nature channels when the wildebeests take a chance of getting a drink with the crocodiles in the water. They would like to have it where they put their nose in the water, they kind of tighten up their lips on the side, they keep their nostrils out of the water, and then if they got that sealed, they open up their jaw, and that creates a negative pressure that allows water to flow in. So it's almost like taking their long nose and making a straw. So that's the way the animals would like to drink. We want to accommodate that as best we can. We certainly don't allow the drinking at the river's edge anymore. So if you want to pull out your facilities manual and turn to the drinking section, the fact sheet page, all this information should be there. We talked some about that in lab on Monday. Cows prefer to drink with their muzzle one to two inches in the water, that posture, no nostrils above the water line. And they take long draws of water, many liters at a time, rather than smaller amounts or sips or slurps. When they're really consuming that, that water, they're kind of billowing their mouth open and closed, open, swallow, open, swallow, open, swallow getting those long draws of water, many liters or quarts at a time. They'll take a break, let that settle. A lot of the water that goes into the reticulum, it doesn't really use the esophageal groove, but it tends to move down the omasum. It doesn't always completely mix in the rumen. It will if it needs to, and there's no esophageal groove there for that deflection, but a lot of the water that's consumed will go to the lower track just by gravity or amount that's coming in will be forced in that direction. So why do cows drink? Why do they consume? If we look at it mathematically, the things that seem to determine the amount an animal will drink within a day is related to milk produced. Milk is 87% water, so the more she produces, the more she's going to export, therefore the more she needs to drink. Dry matter intake, the drier her feed, the more she consumes, the more she will consume of water to kind of balance out that rumen, try to get that rumen less than 20 percent dry matter so it mixes easy it ferments well that liquid in the rumen stuff is moving to the wall things are diffusing it's acting properly the amount of sodium an animal consumes will influence or can be used to calculate how much water she consumes so that sodium intake, it's the thing they use when they give you the free salty snacks at the bar or the restaurant in hopes that you'll buy more drinks. So you're trying to make that adjustment. It works for people, it works for cows. And then environmental temperature has a large effect on how much water they consume. So summertime, they're gonna consume more water in kind of a thermal neutral environment, you can count on a cow producing 100, 110, drink about 30 gallons a day. So you got 10 gallons is going out of that animal as milk. The other 20 gallons are helping her operate, move stuff through. If she's got 25 pounds of 
dry matter being excreted every day, that means that's usually what 20% dry matter somewhere about there. So you're going to have 100 pounds of water being excreted, urine and manure. So there's another 10, 15 gallons there. So that sort of adds up respiration for the balance. So that adds up to about 30 gallons necessary per day. So if we're thinking about our water system, we want to provide fresh, clean water in adequate volume. That's across a day and within the need. Sometimes we get at least in a tie stall, you get those animals outside in the summer. They all come back and they get to their, their stalls. They all want to drink at the same time. If there's not water outside, that two inch line isn't going to cut it. So the animals at the end of the line are going to get the least amount of water. We'd like to provide that water and we'd like her to drink if we can in a more of a natural position. So as close as we can get to that, the cow wading into the river, maybe up to her knees, putting her head down, drink, if she's got that muzzle going. The closer we can get to that, the better off we are. If a cow has to work to drink, if she has to fight, especially with the drinking cups in the tie stall barn, if she's got to fight for that water, after a while she's just going to give up. So planning estimated water requirements. Five, six to 15 gallons for calves and heifers, 20 to 30 for our dry cows, 35 to 50. And we're thinking when we get up in that 50 range, we think about the water associated with cleaning the lines and things like that. So sizing your system, Using those numbers there will help make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be. If you're going and you're taking a look at your animals and you're saying, hey, I don't think we're getting enough water, either by looking at the responses for the animal, so dry manure, lower milk production, things like that, or you're measuring the line, you have some sort of water meter and it's not adding up to what you think it should be or a number that's related to the number of animals that you have. How do we increase water or water intake? We can add more linear water or space per animal. So adding water sources, trying to get to that four inches of linear water space per animal. We can try to increase water pressure or flow. Some of the old tie stalls were producing more in those tie stalls than we ever expected to. The pumps aren't sized the way they're meant to. Or if you're living around here, that if you draw water too fast out of the system, you'll, it'll all turn gray. Does anybody know that around here? So if you pull water too fast out of your well, you get a lot of fine um, dirt associated with it. So I want to increase the pressure flow. So some of those old tie stall barns, instead of relying on when the animals are thirsty, they have a more or less continuous low pressure draw into a water tower effect, a big tank in the second story barns. We don't do hay anymore or a higher elevation somewhere. So that continuous flow and that can feed and add pressure to the system. So making sure that we have a reserve somewhere that's elevated, the principle of a water tower, continuously pumping to the water tower that puts head pressure on the entire system. So water comes out at a reasonable rate. Another thing we can do to increase water intake is increase the frequency of cleaning. So making sure that that water stays fresh, that you're willing to drink it, it seems to consume. When I did my research trial, one of the things 
that we had an individual tie stalls so we could monitor individual intake. Um, once a week, I'd go through, we clean those waters every morning, but once a week, I'd go through and clean them while the cows were being milked in the parlor, go through and clean those water cups with Clorox to make sure that I wasn't testing. Because of the funding associated with my research trial, I had the only spot I had to do a research trial in the summer, which is not something anybody wants to do because of the heat and you get the heat effects on intake. But we had a real good ventilated barn and I made sure that the waterers were super clean. So there wasn't a problem with that. I also on real hot days, we had a bucket of water and a couple towels. We used to wet down the animals and they had individual box fans on top of them. So individual water cooling, it got to the point where when they saw me walk in, they all jumped up happy hoping I would coat them down with water. So tie stalls, if we're thinking about there. Feed space is not usually an issue in tie stalls. Every animal's got their own. But what about water? There is some research to suggest that maybe we should have a waterer on each side of the animal. Has anybody dealt with a tie stall? Normally you have one common water shared between the two animals. That's, you know, keeps costs down, things like that. But there is some research to suggest that there's more water consumption if you have a drinking cup at each stall, either shared between the stalls, the two adjacent stalls, or dedicated to that one animal. So boxed off in some way, shape, or form. I know cows always prefer to steal. I've seen some very weird contortions trying to get into the next stall to get that water. So there is some thought that spending that extra money, we don't have a boss cow that will monopolize that single shared waterer. So if that happens, usually the animal that's subordinate will drink less and the animal that's dominant will drink less because she's spending all her time defending. So if you're putting in a new tie stall, I'd consider putting a drinking cup at, at every stall. Flow is the key. We have smaller pipes associated with those lines. Usually they're part of the feed rail or some sort of part of that front area, usually two inches. If we've got a system that's a dead end, the last cow on the line is going to have the lowest pressure. Maybe it's better if we can loop things around so we can have pressure coming from two directions, just like the um, milk lines in the elevated area. Or, as I said before, we create something that puts head pressure on the system, putting a reserve tank up in the, the barn, allows us to increase the pressure to make sure those cows down at the end get their fair share when they want it. So thinking about a tie stall, where do we put the water? As we mentioned already, do we put it in front? Putting it in front over the feed area keeps the water out of the bedding. But you get more water in, in here and it becomes harder to clean those mangers in the front. We can flip that around, put it in between or in the divider area, but that's gonna have water slopping on the bedding. And sometimes that might be worse than water slopping on the feed. So we'll talk about another option. When I worked at Michigan State, they didn't want water in the feed. During the feeding trials, the nutritionist there didn't want that water, that rotting, that sloppiness to affect intake. So what they created, or the farmers, the, the crew out there created, was bringing the drinking cup back in the stall divider, but we had a tub around it and a shower drain and PVC pipe 
that went in front of the mattress that allowed water to be caught and diverted away from the bedding. So I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. That was one way to get around it. Then you had most of the Thai stall had shared waterers. So shared waterer tub. Then you had PVC running across the front. It wasn't sloped, but gravity sort of cleaned it out. And then that excess water would end up in the drop behind the animals. The downside of all that is all that extra liquid made running up the ramps at the end of the barn a slower process. Um, it was very sloppy, very gooey, very liquidy, so it didn't go up the ramps quite as well as it might, but they tended to leave things running longer and eventually it would clean out. The only downside is if it ever flooded at the uptake ramp. So I'll show you that, what that looks like. So I took some pictures. They redid all the tie stalls that were like 30 years old. So this is what they sort of looked like before we started. You got the buckets there, drinking cup inside, those kind of rubber tubs. The only reason we used them were for sh uh, the sh going to the fair. You've got a shower drain at the bottom, a flex line going to PVC, and that PVC comes out and around and runs in the drop. That excess water doesn't end up in the feed or unless there's special effort, um, it doesn't end up in the bedding. So there's a different look at that old angle, what they were doing. So kind of bolting everything in place, shower drain at the bottom, allowing that water there. One of the things about this tie stall operation is you could not have, if you're doing things for like uh, FDA approval, animals could not steal feed from another one. So when the FDA expectors came in like when they were um, Michigan State was one of the places that uh, did research for BST. So FDA came to expect their facilities and how do they prevent or making sure that this animal here can't get that animal there. So everything was divided. Lots of extra hardware that prevented animals from stealing. So most farms wouldn't have this. But so another perspective there, looking underneath that flex line, and then the crew twice a week when they were redoing bedding, they would drop weights in the drinking cups to flush the lines. So get those drinking cups running, get a whole lot of water going through the system to keep those lines from backing up. It was a little funky. There was a lot of feed in those tubs going through and pulling out all that stuff, usually with two obese things there, sleeves. They went through and they redid their tie stalls. So some of the materials that they used to reestablish the curb going forward. Dividers. And then putting a layer of epoxy down and then marine paint over top of that to keep that area easy to clean out. So getting rid of all the filling in all the pits with epoxy and then doing that slick paint on top. So you can see where the pits were. The epoxy comes out to about here. Laying that out as a person who did way back before and after. You do have to weigh the uh, feed on individual cows. Um, it was a whole lot easier once they redid that. So putting in the, the water line. The water line doubled as a feed door bracket thing. They had to, when they let the animals out, take them to the 
parlor for milking. They had to lock all the doors so other cows couldn't steal other cows' feed. So a lot of extra there. This shelf is where that line ran for the drainage on the tubs. So you can see it a little bit better there. They did a notch here. The downside of all this is that there was about a foot there going forward that the animal was separated from what she stood on to the manger. So you've lost a lot of reach there. So it was important to go through and sweep up on a regular basis, reestablishing those buckets, drainage, and all that wood in. So you had a place for the doors to catch, but it made it tougher for those animals to get up and down. So that line goes in that notch. Those shower drains underneath. Then we have the feed dividers coming in. They covered everything with canvas once they got it in place. Keep some of the dirt out to keep it a little bit cleaner. And then the, those are the feed doors. They pin it on the water line. Well, the water line is up here, but they pin it on this feed rail. They swing down and you pull up the bars there, those points flop down and they catch on that wood there to keep the animals from stealing other cows feed for research purposes. So. And those doors out front swing down, so when you're. Uh, Doing research, it's harder for animals to cross contaminate. Makes it harder to sweep in after, before and after milking. But so, anybody have an interest in that design or information? Okay, so, water and tie stalls. Any questions on that? Reese. Stalls, the things we mentioned when we went out on Monday, not all of them, but most of them. So two or more inches per animal. I prefer four. Um, if there's four inches of water space per animal in the pen, things are usually pretty comfortable. Two or more waterers per pen. We like that top edge somewhere between 22 and 32 inches. We want it high enough to stay clean, high enough so animals are not standing in it so much. Everybody knows why those bars, I forgot to mention that on Monday, but why those bars are over top of the waterers out at the dairy. Keeps the animals from standing in it. I don't know if that's an attempt to cool their feet out, or just get a better perspective of the barn. They want to see things. So those bars that come out over top, keep those animals there. Three stalls, bowls and cups are discouraged. Troughs and tanks are preferred as long as they're long, shallow, and quick filling. So the idea behind that is we get that natural position. How deep does the waterer have to be? She's drinking from a natural position. How long does it have to be? Three inches. That's it. She only uses the top two, especially the ones that go and use, click all the stuff off with their tongue, and then use that there. So if I have something that's six to eight inches deep, I should have a little bit of reserve there but not too much. That six to eight inches allows a certain amount of reserve when an individual animal is drinking, but we don't get that stale water that sits around forever. We should turn over the water on a regular basis. The water that's there should be gone within a couple hours, replaced by fresh stuff. We'd like our waterers 
within 100 feet of each other. I got less than 45. I think I said less than 50 feet. That's easier for my brain to remember. From anywhere in the pen to the nearest water. In California, they tend to do two row barns because it's too hot on the outside. Row of stalls, they won't lay in the afternoon sun. They won't lay in them. But in the Northeast, we have those outside rows. Those outside rows become places without a stalls there. They become places for waterers. So they're a lot hotter there. It stays 90 degrees for three months at a time in that San Joaquin Valley. Having that extra water there is a good thing. We like our waterers to have access from multiple directions if we can. We don't want them sitting in dead ends. There's only one way in, one way out. We'd like to have multiple approaches so those timid animals don't have to fight other animals. They can sneak in and get what they need. So we already did that. Any questions on waterers? Providing water for the animals. In this day and age, we tend to take water for granted. It's always there when we need it. But there are two farms where water was a severe problem. One farm, I missed it. The other farm, it's like, well, we checked everything else. Let's check the water. And water turned out to be the problem. They brought in another source of water. Intakes went up. But more importantly, milk production went way up. So. Making sure that simple thing, low cost thing, gets taken care of. We should have something that's not limiting on our farm. So traffic patterns, we already talked about. Both these are about seven feet long. We want to have with our water birds, we'd like to have some clearance around them. So an animal there, she's six or seven feet back, and then the ability eight feet behind those for two cows, four foot wide, to pass behind that animal. So we're looking at 15 feet of clearance around our waterers, around our feed bunks. The side of that is that eight feet that extra footage increases our barn expense or decreases the number of stalls we have. So we're going to have trade offs there for that. So we went up to the calf barns. We need to check when we're looking at our. Uh, Calf areas, I think in New York, we're doing a lot better because of the focus in the Northeast. Um, Cornell, New Hampshire, on the importance of nutrition for calves. But there are some other places where it's not emphasized quite as much. So the first thing we have to ask with calves, is there water available to those calves? Or is the only liquid they get milk? We want water there for good rumen development, for good development, for good weaning transition. For a number of reasons, if she gets, she can get all her water from the milk, but that's going to make that transition, that weaning harder. And then, if we provided that water, is it clean? And how close is it to the feed? We talked about putting a distance between those. As they get older, they might need up to four or five gallons a day, depending on the weather and depending on where they are in their room and development and how much they might need for successful weaning. So we'll stop there. I got a short quiz for you and we'll call it a day.
So I apologize for the smell. Today was opening plump day up at the dairy. When you're done, you're free to go.